Welcome back for round two of this year's uh, Rind Lectures. Young um, Henry Rind uh, spent a lot of his time travelling uh, out of Scotland um, to other parts of Europe and um, Egypt where it was warmer and the sun shone uh, for the benefit of his health. He maybe had a point actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, it certainly uh, improved enormously his, his understanding of archaeology and the, the contribution he, he made to the subject. So we should be very grateful uh, for that. So anyway, welcome back those of you who were here last night and, uh, and uh, those who have just come this morning. Um, there's, a, there's a good day, a good tomorrow to look forward to. And uh, a warm thank you again to our sponsors from AOC Archaeology Group uh, for supporting this series of Rhine Lectures. Um, we really are grateful to them and for the contribution they make, have made to the wider world of archaeology. So it's my uh, pleasant task to introduce this morning um, an Edinburgh University graduate in archaeology uh, Professor Ian Baxter from uh, University Campus Suffolk. Um, Ian runs the Suffolk Business School at uh, UCS, where he's also a Professor of Historic Environment Management. And um, Ian is, uh, is committed to management development uh, within the sector, enabling a greater understanding of strategic, tactical <coughs> and operational opportunities for heritage organisations. He has in, in, indeed got a very impressive uh, track record um, in administration, in serving on trustees and helping bodies establish themselves. And uh, he was telling me that he, he, he manages to maintain some of his, uh, his uh, interest and knowledge at the, the sharp end of, of archaeological um, projects by being a, a trustee of the West Stowe Anglo-Saxon Village and Ipswich Arts and Museums Trust. Anyway, Ian is going to uh, address us this morning uh, on the subject of archaeological resilience. So, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to have been invited to speak this morning. Um, I should apologise. I'm an archaeologist that works in a business school. Therefore, I very much treat archaeology and heritage management as its, as its larger uh, compatriot as an opportunity to work in a, a range of different realms. And uh, business opportunities and business speak will inevitably uh, slip their way into what I'm about to say this morning. However, what I'm hoping to do is to, uh, as um, the National Trust have taken the opportunity here at Sutton Who. Uh, to put in some scaffolding and climb up to get a different view over sites and monuments and the approach that archaeology can take within society today. And any of you who are within the vicinity of Sutton who within the next couple of weeks, I do encourage you to go and climb up their very large and slightly rickety scaffolding tower to get a different view of the site, which they are uh, putting in place to to work out how they can best encourage a different visitor experience at the site. And certainly seeing, seeing the site from nine metres up, putting it into its wider context, is quite interesting. Not least watching the various, the typical National Trust demographic tourists climbing up that nine metre <laughs> tower. So what do we mean by resilience? What I'm going to talk about today is um, resilience theory, something that uh, has cropped up within archaeology and is used. It has some roots within an understanding of ecosystems and landscapes. And make the reference back to Rind and his comments as they're resonant with resilience. I'll then talk a little bit about the, the long durée of archaeology and uh, suggest that it is indeed resilient despite having various challenges and then have a, a whiz through, a very much a, a, a skip through contexts in which archaeology and heritage, and I, I apologise for using those terms interchangeably, um, operate within society and provide both opportunity and challenge in today's society. Um, inevitably, I'm going to throw some organisational theory in, and I would encourage anyone who has 
spent many years working in government or non-governmental organisations and suffered at the hands of management consultants to heckle at appropriate moments. <laughs> um, and uh, perhaps just draw some conclusions that on balance, whereabouts do we think we are? So Rind as a character, um, setting out his views in British archaeology, its progress and demands, I think his voice that comes through within that text is one that is based on study, connection and position within society, not only of himself and his own views, but also of where he sees the opportunities, threats, challenges, strengths and weaknesses. I've already got in some management theory there, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Um, as he identifies various issues within uh, the state of the world as he saw it. He makes mention of the, the establishment of a British antiquities department. He talks about treasure hunters and treasure trove. He talks about local <coughs> museums. He talks about visitors, particularly to the Crystal Palace, and therefore touches on interpretation and history. He talks about the, the government role and learned societies. He talks about reconstruction. He talks about recording and survey and ordnance survey and mapping. And he talks about, makes mention of systematic care, something that we come back to time and time again as we discuss archaeology and heritage in the modern policy world. He compares ancient monuments to other related realms, to, ancient to, to, to literature, to records, and therefore that gives him some resonance with the policy focus and our overlapping interests with other uh, realms in, in modern society, working alongside museums, arts and other cultural bodies. He also mentions the uh, peculiarities of the home countries, and that's something I'll come back to as we see the structures of heritage management changing as we speak. And he also makes international comparisons to put archaeology and the opportunities for it and the challenges for it on the international stage. So if you think a little bit about resilience theory in archaeology itself, it's a rich, there's a rich intellectual history of anthropologists and archaeologists um, interested in human and environmental relations. And I'm going to use the, the application of resilience theory in archaeology not to think about the, the interpretation of sites, finds, and interpretation of past societies itself but to, to use it as an analogy for thinking about how we can understand resilience in archaeology as a concept, a process, and an industry in its own right. So drawing on um, Redmond's comments in, in 2005, uh, writing an American anthropologist, ecologists strongly assert that the current condition of many landscapes and dynamics that govern them could not be understood without close attention to the effects of historic land use. There's a complex web of relationships that are based on multiple interactions of underlying patterns and processes of both the ecological and social domain. This article and other related articles um, of, a, of the similar period, which began to, to apply resilience theory into archaeology, looked at the human and environmental relationships. And I would suggest that we can revisit some of that in looking again at human and business environmental relations. Um, and whilst critique can be made of, the, of a biological systems approach, uh, and indeed is so within much management uh, critique and thinking today, uh, it, for our purposes, I think it's valid to continue to make some of those uh, analogous comments. So only with a long-term perspective can we identify many of uh, which beneficial near-term actions truly contribute to long-term resilience and recognise how seemingly rational choices lead in the end to undesirable outcomes. The converse of this is that some social adaptations or cultural traditions may appear inefficient or illogical when viewed in the short term, but reduce risk and increase resilience in the long term. Now that's a statement again that talks very much in terms of its, uh, of its interpretation of the archaeological record, but you want, if one takes a step back and thinks of it in terms of understanding of archaeology and heritage in the modern world itself. It is still very much relevant. <coughs> so we need to be aware of linked dynamics across scales. Um, 
particularly fast and slow variables that affect archaeology in the world and the mismatch of scales as to whether we're working as archaeologists as individuals within projects, within organisations, be they governmental, non-governmental, community-led or international, um, international collaborations. And I suggest that resilience theory and our adapted use of it today perhaps seeks to understand source and role of change and particularly the kinds of change that are transforming in systems that can be adaptive. The fact that 235 years later uh, we're still here as a society of antiquaries suggests that something is indeed resilient. And I had wondered whether to just say that at the start and then send you all off for a coffee. To <laughs> save yourselves an hour of management theory. So we think the opportunity for... There is some opportunity for trite phrases in what I'm going to say. It's not necessarily philosophical, but I think it's very practical. And what I'm particularly interested in working in a business school is the process of relationships. The ecosystem of archaeology itself and the, the profession. What can we do as individuals, as collective, either with interests in projects, purposes of archaeology, or purposes of organisations themselves? What do we do that have implications for the resource, the knowledge, our knowledge, other people's knowledge and education, for participants in the subject and for the structure of the subject itself? And if we refer back again to the original application of resilience theory, and this is the first of a number of confusing pictures that I apologise for putting in front of you, the stylized representation of the, the four ecosystem functions can be again be mapped to organisational change. And <coughs> this idea of exploitation, conservation, release and reorganisation applies not only to past societies as interpreted through the archaeological record, but organisations as they attempt to survive, adapt, understand, develop new products and services, engage with new markets, and ultimately develop specialisms and uh, collaborate across changing environmental and business circumstances in which they operate. And we'll come back at the end, I think, to, to another, uh, uh, another of these sort of virtuous circles, which um, will certainly be... Uh, something recognisable from Simon Thurley's approach in his virtuous cycle of heritage. <coughs> it's worth also thinking that it's, that's quite interesting in the ecological systems approach, the, the remember and revolt cycles. And I think as, as uh, rebels that archaeologists tend to think themselves as within society, um, the remember and revolt is quite important that we're seeing substantial change and have always seen substantial change in the way that we do things. Archaeologists, I think, like to argue as people. And that makes the organisations in which they form themselves and the organisations in which they work interesting places. Um, as anyone who with anthropological or ethnographic training would observe sitting in policy development discussions and having had the opportunity for a number of years to sit somewhat on the sidelines of the discussions around the creation of the new policy frameworks, both in England and Scotland, the interaction and behaviour of archaeologists acting as archaeologists in either their own or other people's interests has always been somewhat interesting and incorporates aspects of both remember and revolt <coughs> along the way. But if we put things into a much broader, broader perspective on the international spectrum, the long durée itself means that archaeology has a role in wider society and indeed allies to thinking on social action at a global level as picked up through the United Nations Development Programme and others that we see in documents produced in different parts of the world on an international scale talk of resilience in the modern world and as people are advised on what makes places and people resilience oftentimes a, a reach back to the cultural heritage and the material culture, the archaeology of the places in which people live and breathe, spend their time working and playing, are used as the bedrock on which resilience can be built. And if you look at the development processes within 
uh, on an international scale within the transformation of public services and communities in education and in social development. It's quite often that you see expressions of concern at a community level where communities reject are increasingly rejecting ideas of economic growth for its own sake and envisaging models of development based on environmental protection and historic preservation. So whilst at times we may rue the role of archaeology in our ability to influence things, I think if one looks carefully within documentation at a global level, archaeology has a very real and resonant role to play on a day-to-day -day basis. Most obviously we see this playing out in the very term regeneration. And working as I do in a, on a historic waterfront, historic medieval waterfront in Suffolk, which has been regenerated and seeing archaeology and the maritime history of the past absolutely key to its potential as a future destination. Ipswich is not known for its tourism potential. However, the growth of uh, a new university, the growth of the preservation of the historic environment, the blending of old and new, the opportunities for architects to engage with place and people and the material culture make for sustainable development a very interesting prospect for a town that has not really been on the map for people to visit. So sticking with the idea of the, the United Nations Development Programme models, um, the resilience wheel as has been developed in San Francisco places the use of culture and heritage and <laughs> historic preservation and people's identity and engagement with their material remains of the past at the heart of something which, it, which resonates with them, them as individuals and their individual identity and aspirations within a community in what they feel that they can do within organisations and what the community as a cohesive whole might be able to do. And through programme development using archaeology in different parts of the world, um, the analysis that's been undertaken by the UNDP notes that it's possible to build resilience as a transformative process with potential to strengthen the capacity of people and their communities, send, send countries and institutions to anticipate, prevent and rec recover from and transform in the aftermath of shocks, stresses and change. And as we'll see in a little while as I come on to the global geopolitics of archaeology, I think the opportunity for what archaeology can do in reconstruction and redevelopment remains very much key to uh, building relationships as much as it can be used to destroy relationships. <coughs> so the UNDP's principles that it respects on respect for context, respect for national ownership, the need for integrated approaches, for promoting knowledge sharing and awareness raising, for the need for long-term engagement and planning, and for partnerships. Those are principles that we see playing out all the time within archaeological projects themselves. And whilst this might sound somewhat ethereal at this global level of understanding and perhaps, critically speaking, an idea that is nice in parts but difficult to achieve. Burrell, writing in 2012 as part of an architecture, um, an architectural development PhD, tries to really apply some of these principles to think about how into the international development context for human development allows culture providing the context in which all development can take place and that archaeology therefore has a role within that. Development practice needs to use culturally engaging methods to achieve long-term development impacts and what better than an engagement with things that are interesting that either come out of the ground or appear in museum catalogues or on shelves for people to look at and engage with. That human development is people-centred it offers people properties to prioritise and action their aspirations as part of the development process. Asset-based approaches in principle three. Cultural action, the use of arts and by virtue archaeology as well for education, development and social impact. That it can unlock social, human, cultural, financial and political assets by building social capital. So cultural and social capital are a part of this. 
Have we come a long way from archaeology, though, in thinking about development on the broadest scale? I would argue not, for if we look at the fundamental tenets of what we do as archaeologists, contributing to understanding the material and beyond remains <coughs> of the past, we bring a variety of opportunities for resilience to all kinds of other contexts in which we operate. So Burnell, is, despite writing from a conservation architecture point of view, encapsulates this within her sustainable livelihoods approach. However, it's fair to say that over the past few years we've perhaps become a little bit focused on organisations and perhaps less focused on the stuff of archaeology. Now this of course gets me hugely excited and probably the rest of you glazing over at this point. But the organisations in which we operate are, have huge opportunities for understanding in terms of dynamics. They change all the time from the pressures, the business processes, the people working within them. And the need to understand organisational development and its relationship to archaeology, I think, is very much a, a necessity which has been underplayed. I find it somewhat surprising within working with colleagues within business schools, that management and management theory really doesn't engage very much with heritage and archaeology. And likewise, as we as archaeologists, don't really engage very much with management theory or organisational development theory. Talking at the Chartered Institute for, Field, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists conference last week in Cardiff, in a session on project management, Lots of talk about the role of the project within archaeology, but not very much talk about what project management itself means and what it means to manage things, processes and people within the wider undertaking. But coming back to the stuff itself. Ancient monuments can be dangerous. That's the typical Ministry of Works sign. But the museum collections, the material that appears uh, to interpret, for people to engage with, offer a, an individual scope and scale for identifying stories, identifying places, identifying people's identities, and as we heard yesterday, the alternative stories that can come from individuals and um, uh, material culture itself providing an opportunity to provide different forms of interpretation that can, uh, can be both cohesive and divisive depending on one's point of view means that there are ways in which this can provide resilience but at the same time can provide division as well. Resilience as a concept though is one that has been picked up very much as a result of the economic crisis coming at the end of the uh, last decade. And Heritage Counts, as the, the, uh, and the Heritage Audit, the equivalent within Scotland, has uh, took resilience to its heart within its analysis in 2012. It recognised that the economic roles relevant to the heritage sector mean that it has to play, uh, it has to be understood in terms of the economics, of private wealth, of public subsidy, of people's willingness to pay, of charitable cause, of commerce or of enterprise, of social enterprise and new stages on which archaeology can play a role. And we recognise that the, the economics has fed into that previous slide that I put up on organisational change, that many parts of organisational change have come about through the economic requirements of need to move on, to change our services, to change the way that we deliver and engage with the, uh, the public past and the private past as part of organisations. Economic support has therefore shifted and the, the arguments within the heritage sector of a despite mentality 
should we look after these things despite their needs, despite their costs? It has to be thought of in terms of the different political rhetoric, both in Scotland and England, when the culture ministers have considered art for art's sake as opposed to art for economics' sake, and where archaeology therefore fits into the experiential economy, heritage and its scientific innovation, heritage and broader uh, role within the cultural economy, within urban development, and indeed within a sustainable, low-carbon, sustainable economy. <coughs> so this has played out particularly in research undertaken in 2012 uh, for heritage counts, looking at the business demand for heritage goods and services, and really beginning to understand the business of heritage and the business of archaeology as an industrial sector and the channels of economic impact that archaeology and wider heritage assets could have within society. The, this was the first proper analysis, in my view, of the business role, the relate, thinking of archaeology as uh, a business in its entirety, as opposed to business circumstances that would have been driven by public policy through PPG 16 and 15 and the growth of commercial development archaeology, which has established itself 20 years earlier as part as a very specific industrial sector. It was an opportunity, therefore, despite major economic change within society at large, to step back and think of what is this business of heritage and this business of archaeology that we're doing. Where do we see money flows and people's engagement? And how can we conceptualize that in economic terms, in terms of its direct impact and its indirect impacts and its total impacts within the world? It's very easy to correlate that with tourism. And unsurprisingly, as I work within a business school, it's one that we do quite a lot of work on. That if we think of heritage and in its cultural tourism, the value of culture and the value of engaging with archaeology as a discipline and as a set of remains to be seen on the ground by visitors, we put it into the realm of cultural tourism in its broader context. Cultural tourists are tourists that spend more, cultural tourists stay longer, cultural tourists tend to have higher levels of education, cultural tourists tend to visit more sites as part of their experience, cultural tourists buy more guidebooks, cultural tourists engage with a range of different cultural assets. So the cultural tourist and by analogy, the archaeological tourist, because that subset of cultural tourism spend even more and engage even more and are even more participatory in terms of their understanding, their, their taking on of different visitor experiences, are the golden, the golden egg within the tourism sector. The cultural tourist is a, is a tourist that is sought after. The cultural tourist is one that engages the cultural tourist is one, although that is quite demanding and wants to see quality and wants to see uh, a range of experience that, that resonate with their own background and interests. Visit Britain, visit Scotland, visit England, the various national tourism organisations therefore have begun to properly assess archaeology within cultural tourism. It's made the links across to ancestral and geneal genealogical interests. It's made the links across to opportunities to link sites and move people through destinations as they visit different sites and not just focus on a single location. It's also provided new business opportunities. And for anybody that's visited the new Stonehenge Visitor Centre, one can only be amazed at the sheer range of Stonehenge goodies on display. A million people presumed to pass through this shop over the course of a year, buying, able to buy everything from Neolithic picnic sets on the bottom right, 
his and hers Stonehenge hoodies and garments in all shapes and sizes, the obligatory jute bag, which heritage site now doesn't have a jute bag for sale, and a jewellery section which can only be described as staggering, with articles, items on display to on both his and hers jewellery for those of for with, with or without piercings, with or without uh, Celtic tattoos, with or without different aspects of adornment that they can engage and identify with Stonehenge as a place of identity and <coughs> spiritual engagement, ranging from 299 to 2,999 pounds. Archaeology has the opportunity to be hard-nosed about its economics. Archaeology, therefore, can provide very, very good source material for the tourism souvenir industry. If you work in the tourism sector, as I suppose I should admit I do, heritage is great. The current campaign being run by Visit Britain to encourage international visitors to come to the country, to all parts of the country, uses cultural heritage and cultural heritage iconography across most of its media assets. We can argue over the use of Great Britain, and it's no doubt a dis discussion point that we may come on to over the course of the weekend. But without doubt, archaeology is resilient in providing a range of visual opportunities to engage with for the visitor. And one just hopes that the experience that we can provide as archaeologists make that experience itself resilient as we provide um, different kinds of digital, social and mediatised experience for visitors as they engage with sites themselves and as they wander around and, and our museums and our cultural sites. And this is indeed an area where I think we're having to play some degree of catch-up with other parts of the tourism industry. There's no doubt that we're making great strides and the museum sector itself must be lauded for its, its very great range of approaches to engaging the tourist. But our approaches within archaeology have been very long-standing, have the great potential to provide a depth of experience which the cultural tourist is motivated to engage with, which provides even greater opportunity for economic resilience within what we do. So I've said the cultural tourist is one, the archaeological tourist, I should say, is one which is really quite picky in what they will and won't do. They recognise that uh, they recognise that the, uh, there is quality in understanding where they came from and where they're going to. They recognise that archaeology can tell them things about themselves and about the place and about the landscape. And they recognise that archaeology has a significant opportunity to provide a depth of engagement with a destination. But let's move on to looking at archaeology as a set of <coughs> jobs, a set of career paths, a set of people as an employment sector and as an industrial sector within the country. Landward Research has been working over a number of years to profile the profession on behalf of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists and the Institute of Historic Building Conservation has also been charting the professional growth of the uh, ebbs and flows of jobs within the sector over the past decade. Now we can see from 1922 from Wheeler as a source identifying the number of professional archaeologists working in the UK as being 24 through to the explosion in the 1990s as a result of the growth of commercial archaeology. And then we see 
in 2012, the, as a result of the economic recession, the lowering of our professional archaeologists within the UK. Without doubt, we can see that the profession itself has become one that is resilient by virtue of its size, but by virtue of the peaks and troughs within the graph, one that sees still significant challenges. If we look in more detail at anticipated or reported changes as reported within uh, local authorities and uh, conservation and archaeology services, views are more mixed and the need for, to engage with resilience as a concept is one that is never far away from the minds of the archaeological contractors or the local authority curators. We see change over the last 20 years or so of views as to whether the profession is in growth, whether people feel it's stable, or whether people feel it's in decline. But what it's fair to say from this graph is that people feel that certainly it's a turbulent sector in which to work. Interesting, therefore, are if one looks at university figures of where are the future graduates and the future workers of archaeology are coming from and how many of them there are. The graphs potentially paint a positive picture. <coughs> full-time undergraduates, the top left graph here showing uh, uh, full-time undergraduates has grown significantly but is beginning to tail off. On the other hand, the part-time undergraduates and part-time postgraduates have seen catastrophic falls in line with broader falls within part-time student markets, but one which is of concern to us as a profession because of the uh, long-standing tradition of part-time engagement with, with education within the, within the uh, subject area. Within archaeology as a physical science on the bottom right, the picture is a perhaps a little bit more rosy with full-time undergraduate, full undergraduate numbers continuing to climb. However, what we do need to look at is the fact that this is a picture of people already in the education system. If we look at the number of students actually starting archaeology degrees, the figures in the top right hand corner, we've seen a fall from 2007 of 530 people enrolling through the UCAS, through the Central University Admissions System, to the most recently reported figures from UCAS last month, which is showing the, the annual, the, the number of applications enrolments coming in down to 415. Now this in itself may not be a problem, given that there's still a large number of students within the system. However, it is concerning when one hears, as I did at the, the IFA conference last week, that the upturn within the commercial building market and the large-scale projects that are underway, and if you think of large-scale infrastructure such as HS2 or the Thames Tideway Tunnel, is going to have a need for more archaeologists than perhaps we're able to supply. So we therefore need to think about the, the challenge of resilience within our supply of labour into the market within the future. And we're not going to get onto the issue of how necessarily people can pay for an education within a, a higher education world which is fast changing and becoming a challenge to students on a daily basis. Within the conservation side of the picture, figures from the IHBC are perhaps a little more mixed. We're seeing a gradual change and uh, decline within specialist advice that's available to local authorities. And so we have to ask the challenge of our, how we sustain ourselves and how <coughs> resilient we are within organisations that we work for and how resilient the need for our professional skills are within the organisations that we engage with. If we turn to thinking about people themselves, the resilient approach that organisations take in dealing with crisis and change is to get together and begin to plan things out. And we're beginning to see more and more connections being drawn. 
as we try to place museum collections in context with other cultural and social services, with archaeology at the very local level beginning to engage in all kinds of places and programmes that we didn't think would be possible. So as I picture here a, a workshop that I was part of at the Ipswich Museum a few months back where we had a range of officers from across the county council and local authority services from community safety, from social services, from health and well-being, from the museum service, from the archaeology service, all beginning to, in the great way as you can draw on a wall, begin to make the connections in terms of what we can potentially do and what archaeology could do to engage in different ways. Heritage experiences for children, of course, are long-standing within the heritage world. The success of the, the Young Archaeologists Club, the success of children engaging with schools programmes in museums and at archaeological sites, and the experiential approach that the, our, new, our new version of English heritage is pushing ever harder in terms of getting children to properly experience the past is one that is having resonance and having long-lasting educational links uh, and, in the, and, uh, and effects on children's psyche. The opportunity to properly engage with sites and monuments that perhaps they thought weren't relevant to them, that they didn't feel that they could necessarily engage with that interpreted in new and dynamic and interesting ways allow them to be creative, to engage in other forms of education using archaeology as a resource in multiple different contexts. Now, it'd be wrong, I'm going to move, it'd be wrong of me to not to mention environmental resilience. If so, if we move away from the social action of archaeology to the material remains themselves. This is the North Norfolk coast last year with tidal inundation causing large devastation across uh, the, the, the coastline. Environmental resilience and broader environmental thinking about how managed retreat, our changing landscape and the effect of weather and climate change on our coast and in our towns and in our cities as flood defences are moved and changed and the opportunities and potential threats and therefore the challenge to resilience of archaeology as a profession and as a profession to record and look after the resource is one that is very live. No more so than the Coastal Heritage at Risk project in Scotland beginning to identify where there are serious potential issues of resilience of the resource around the coast, which provide not only the opportunity to discover new sites, but equal provide very, very real threat to long-standing favourites and items that are already considered of world heritage, world heritage importance. So resilience in archaeology has also got us into the realms of thinking about risk management and risk management approaches. And the management of risk and the th identification of threats is never more present when we move to the realm of global geopolitics. Archaeology as identity can be a force for good, can be a force for challenge, and can be a force for evil. Archaeology, the economics of archaeology, in terms of looted antiquities, can be in the realms of millions to billions of pounds. The destruction of cultural and religious sites <coughs> is a challenge for our thinking on resilience as a subject and as a group of professionals. The challenge, therefore, is one to think about on our home shores in terms of environment and on farther shores in terms of the cultural engagement and the creation and destruction of histories within different 
cultural norms to those of our own. So I don't want to dwell too much though on bad news. Let me come back to the opportunity. This wonderful uh, thought chart as created within the Heritage Counts uh, report this year begins to capture all of those possibilities and all of those challenges. And we've seen in the public policy realm heritage and archaeology and the opportunities for it and the benefits derived from it being recorded in an ever more structured way. This has culminated most recently in Scotland through the historic environment strategy for the country. And it's very interesting to note that this is not a government strategy. This is a strategy for the people of Scotland, our place in time. Now, along the way, the policy development process has meant MSPs scratching their heads at times and saying, who's responsible? The response, of course, being, we all are. The response back, of course, saying, yes, but who's responsible? <laughs> that is a typical pu public policy conundrum, but one that I think shows that the resilience of archaeology and the resilience of heritage and the resilience of our profession has come a very long way. That we've seen archaeologists who really didn't think they were public policy professionals engaging with the complexities, the horrid complexities of the public policy strategy cycle, of thinking about visions and of principles and of priorities and of outcomes. And being able to hammer home the fact that archaeology and expressed within the policy realm as the historic environment is important. Because there's something at the heart of it. There's something for everyone. It's an ambitious subject, it's an ambitious profession. And despite threats and needs for thinking about organisations to engage in different ways, to engage in ways of doing things differently, to change their routines, to change the way that they organise, to change the way that they govern, the fact that historic environment and archaeology can be mainstreamed a wonderful public policy phrase, shows the resilience and tenacity within the subject and the profession. That brings with it, though, a paradox, and one that I think, as a management researcher, needs a little bit more teasing out. For as we mainstream archaeology in the world around us, as it sees an opportunity to play a role on international policy, in public sector service reform, in environment and rural development, in education and lifelong training, if we're mainstreamed, are we not special anymore? And if we're not special, does that mean we get ignored? That whilst resilient behaviour is often a reflection of the internal conditions within organisations, and I would argue that we've been rather successful of late, in terms of getting our pitch onto the public stage, in terms of art and the value of culture within society. The economics and the efficiencies of what we've done have a potential to reduce our flexibility and our adaptability as a profession. As we become ever more specialised and ever more efficient, as we reduce redundancy in our processes, as we streamline our connectivity, as we allow our systems and our business to produce more at a lower cost of labour, materials and energy, in order to bring competitive advantage within the discipline, there's a challenge that's raised. Can archaeology continue to be structured in a way that it is flexible? So to... to to begin to round off with some real terrible management thinking. The Boston Box Matrix. 
On one, on one axis, we have resilience. And on the other axis, we have challenge and threat. Where are we at any one point in terms of what we're doing? If we have low resilience and low challenge or threat, there's evidence to suggest there have been periods of decline within the subject and within our visibility. If we have high resilience and low challenge and threat, then things are so-so. The status quo is maintained. Is that as good as we want it to be, though? Is that matching our ambition as archaeologists within the profession? If we have high resilience and high challenge, we have to mitigate threats. But do we also become innovators? Or if we have low resilience and high challenge, do we lose what we cherish so dearly? So we come back to the heritage cycle, as proposed from the former chief executive of English Heritage. We must hold fast to our values because they enable us to think in a resilient way. On balance, things aren't so bad. Rind was of his time, and I think he was of our time. We have resilience within adversity. We win some, but we lose some. As a resource, we have adaptability in both our profession and the actual material remains themselves. As a resource use, we provide a challenge for sustainability. Our product has cachet, currency, and consumability. The organisation has, that has a cause is one that has resonance within society, despite the varied contexts and demands at any point. So if there's a lesson in terms of resilience in archaeology, I suggest that it's therefore not to be complacent and to continue to encourage the kind of thinking that Ryan started with and that we continue with, to be passionate, curious and professional. Because it, we're either resilient or we're persistent. Thank you very much. Indeed, Ian, that's uh, really good. Very wide ranging and thought provoking. Uh, uh, um, Ian's prepared to take questions or comments if there are any from the audience. Let's stay with them. I, um, I'd like to suggest that we face a conundrum. Right at the beginning, you said. Um, of course, the archaeologists like arguing with Stavra. Uh, and of course, um, a lot of that argument, I presume you meant, was about the archaeology itself. But in my experience, we also argue about how we deal with all the issues you then went on to discuss. And I wonder, first, if you think that's a real problem for us in trying to get a unified view to persuade the outside world, the rest of the world, that we have something to contribute and don't argue in public about it. Um, and also, in my experience, we also have a, a, a problem in looking at uh, the subject you've been discussing um, in another way. There's a, still, a, to me, a serious divide between those who are interested in archaeology, in my world, ancient monuments, and those who are interested in historic buildings. And to try to come together is really very difficult. If I can just throw in one example. Take Vienna, which is a world heritage site, which has a Roman fortress underneath it. But you wouldn't understand that if you talk to anybody who did in the world heritage site. The other aspects of the heritage are forgotten in the face of the, the single importance of, in this case, the world heritage site. So there's, there's two questions for the uh, area, if I may. Sure. Um, I, think, I think you raise, raise an important, important couple of questions there. I think, I think you're... I think you're, you're, you're right to some, to some extent. I suppose I've, I've spent quite a lot of time working, I suppose, outside the profession, thinking about management in the broader context. And certainly when I've engaged with fellow business and management researchers who have, be, who have looked at 
from outside in to our context. There are, there, are, there are other areas of specialism and technical professional specialism that have e those equal arguments. But as a, co uh, as a if, you, if you consider us under the label of the historic environment, whilst I'm not wanting to brush over those differences, I think our performance, despite divisions within what we do, our collective performance is on balance, positive, and broadly speaking, coherent. I think when we get to the individual, and this is why I suppose the, the, the anthropological approach to looking at what goes in within our organisations begins to tease out those re very real differences, both in terms of professional background and, and histories. And, you, and you're right, you know, the historic buildings and archaeology approaches are, 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 are quite significantly different. None more so than, you know, we, you know, I scratch my head at times and think, well, you know, why, why do we continue to persist with two professional institutes within a, within a sector that perhaps logically might have a single one? But there are fund. I don't. I don't. And I don't wish to, to to dissuade us from thinking that there are significant philosophical differences in a, in a, in approach. However, I think if we if we if we looked at our balance sheet of a profession, I think the the the, the variability within it um, on balance works works itself out. Um, I would argue, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of thinking within organisational development theory that would, would suggest that the differences bring about innovation and those arguments are, are, are great and good and are part of the process. Um, and I think the, what's been interesting, particularly the creation of the, the Historic Environment Strategy for Scotland, uh, that the eventual document that we have as the policy there are hundreds and hundreds of pages behind that that are you know, quite, quite distinct arguments and ideas and strands that have been played out. But if you just read that do single document, you wouldn't get any of that because we paint a much more rose pic rosy picture. And that, that is the inevitability, I suppose, of the, of the public policy process. And that's certainly the inevitability when you consider things in terms of the sort of the, at a UN level, the kind of the development program level, that... There's these dangers of a rosy picture when we have very real resilience issues. Um, but I think there is, a, there is a good will towards what we do and a good will to want to engage with what we do that continues, that, that, that persists and makes us resilient. Um, the picture you're presenting, particularly at the end with that... Um, with that drawing that said, we live here, is one of archaeology that is very localised. People are interested in something because it is accessible. Uh, one classic example is Sutton Hoo, of course, which has been very well displayed, but which one might, together with its associated local sites by the National Opera Cast and the rest, um, but one might suggest that a lot of its value is that it is because it, it's because within easy day tripping range from both the Midlands and pretty well anywhere in southeast England. Now, if Sutton who happened in, say, East Yorkshire, would it or should it be seen as less significant? Would it or should it be seen as less worthy of public expenditure? Either directly or indirectly, um, or or would it or, or would it not have the same prominence? Now that's a real challenging question. I, and I very and I think you'll you'll note that I don't think I used the word significant. Did I use the word significance? I don't, that you did. I don't think I did. I know it was probably quite deliberately that I didn't use the word significance because as soon as one gets into, um, I think. The, the tourism world is, is a very fickle one, which relies on transport and of visibility and of marketing and of experience and doesn't automatically correlate itself with the, the, the fundamental importance or, or significance of sites within their localities or the importance of the potential that those sites have within broader cultural history. I mean, we are, 
interestingly, at Sutton Hoo at the moment, we're working on a project within the university to look at it as a, as a, as a business proposition within tourism that if Sutton Hoo is taken alongside the notion of the Saxon shore, ultimately we're dealing with a group of sites and a location where, where Anglia became England, which we're sort of we're falling onto as our strap line, which the tourism lot love. You know, everybody loves a good strap line. Now, how much of that is actually resonant to local communities? we're trying to tease out at the moment, and how much of that is resonant to cultural tourists who already have a level of knowledge, and how much of that is significant to businesses within the area. So I think there's, there's still quite a lot of work to, we, as a profession, we've, we've come a long way in discussing value and significance as applied to the sites themselves, uh, and the, the material remains that sit within our museums and our collections and our data. I think we're still some way to thinking through the relationship of significance in those different realms in terms of people's engagement with um, sites, with experiences, with places, if they were in different geographic locales. So I think, it's, I think what you lay out actually is, remains as a challenge. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff that stood out for me was the um, the problem with the, the fallen numbers of university students wanting to become archaeologists, and then of course the over kind of the overriding idea that we want to encourage more and more people to to visit sites and engage and spend money and, and, and therefore create that resilience within within the field. And is there any do you know of any kind of plans or any investment that looks at earlier education, because currently history, in, certainly in Scot Scottish schools, the study of history is falling t to the point where some schools are no longer offering it because they're not getting the numbers, and that's really worrying, and I think that, are there any, do you know of any plans or any sort of backward looking investment into the earlier, how do we get people to want to look at history and want to look at archaeology and therefore make the resilience that we're looking at? Yeah. This, it's, this, I'll admit this isn't my thing about resilience lower down the system, in other words, I mean, to, to, to create the, the archaeologists and the, the, the people who have the professional passion and, and knowledge of the future. I'm not an expert at things lower down the system, but I recognise this as a challenge. And you know, certainly with, if I put my hat on as a head of a, head of a university department, what goes on and what is coming out of the school system, what's going on within the school system, I think is, is, is one of fundamental concern to, to people across the university sector. And, and I think particularly for, for archaeology and, and allied historical, historical disciplines. Um, we, have, we have, of course, seen the, the massive growth in heritage degrees. Um, and I've got to be careful what I say here because we've just launched one as well, so I can't be too rude about it. Um, th that what worries me is in the blending of subjects that go into more generalised history stroke business stroke tourism approaches is that they don't, um, the, 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 the depth of resilience of the subject matter isn't necessarily there. So there is a, there's, a, there's another graph that I could have brought up from the UCAS that you know, whilst, whilst we're seeing a slide within archaeology, people coming into archaeology, into the more general historical and philosophical, philosoph philosophy studies grouping of subjects, there is a continued rise there. Which, so, whether things, so whether we are in a cycle, um, we, need, we need to look at. But I think I, I'm, I'm not too depressed by what I see because there, I, you see working across the museum sector, across the NGO sector, you know, organisations like Archaeology Scotland and the CBA and the Young Archaeologists Club and others, there is still huge take up of use of archaeology as a resource, um, particularly, and, 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 the, and the subject has made huge strides into making itself relevant to multiple subject areas. And I think um, we maybe need to, to, and of course there's been, given the, the cost of delivery of the subject within a university setting, that's a, that's a challenge from the, on the university side of things as well. So I think we're in an interesting time all round, and I don't think I've got either the knowledge or the answers for it right now. <laughs>
Yes, Roger. That was a very interesting talk, Ian. Thank you very much for it. Um, one of the things that concerns me, particularly, again, in recent policy issues within Scotland, um, is the way in which government appears to be, as it were, saying this is something which is now a public matter and not something which is to be, as it were, from the top down. It's going to be from the bottom up. Uh, and that's all very well except it can lead to an instability, it seems to me, a, a very powerful instability in terms of the exploitation and uh, understanding of archaeological material. I'll give you an example. In Poland, there's a site, of course, Biskupin, which is a very famous site, waterlogged site, a uh, wooden fortress. And until the advent of radiocarbon dating, it was thought to be the first village of the Slavs, and millions visited it every year from all over Poland, and indeed wider. And indeed it became a source of disagreement during the Second World War because the Germans were trying to prove it was not the first village of the Slavs, and et cetera, et cetera. But now radiocarbon dating has shown us, of course, that it is in fact a Bronze Age. And that has caused considerable difficulty because the visitor numbers have evaporated. Um, now there is almost, I, I, I'm going too far in saying this, but there's almost an attempt to mm, um, keep a little calm and quiet about the chronology of the site, the precise chronology, in order to keep the numbers up. Now, that is a consequence, it seems to me, of uh, trying to involve an under-informed public in what is the nature of our study. Um, and that is partly a result of the decapitation of the profession. And it seems to me that's possibly, we're now falling into the same trap of the decapitation of the profession, the resignation towards a popular support for the subject, which in turn may lead to instability and to possible decline. Now, I know that's possibly <laughs> anathema to your ears, but um, I'd like your response to it. I think, I think you raise a very interesting... Um, ch ch whether, whether it's a challenge, whether it's an opportunity, I think the, without doubt the, the change in the organisational circumstances within the, within the home countries right now is very, very interesting and I think speaks a little bit to what, to what you're saying. We have approaches within England with the demerger of English heritage and historic England. We have the merger of Royal Commission and Historic Scotland up here. We have uh, the, 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 the monuments records being um, added layers put onto them to allow public interaction and public co-creation of the resource. And I think it, it's, we're getting into the realm of what it means to be an expert and what is the role of the expert in, in all of this. Um, and I think we just need to be, I suppose without being drawn into the, 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 pol the politics with a big P of this, the, I think it's, it's, we may be seeing things on a cycle again. <coughs> I think I think there there's uh, if you look at um, Kondatyev curves or whatever the the, the sort of the, the, the businesses working on businesses and organisations <coughs> working on cycles over 30, 50, and 100 year processes, we are we're seeing significant change right now as a result of a set of social and political circumstance that without doubt I think will change again. I think the the change has happened a lot quicker. Because of the economic, because of economic drivers, particularly, um, but I mean, sort of what's very interesting with, with the demerger of English heritage, of course, is something that uh, the system that's been in place, an organisational system that's been in place for the best part of a hundred years, has been, has been the process of being reconfigured. I won't say dismantled, but reconfigured. <coughs> but English heritage, the, the 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 national monument collection that has been licensed for. Um, looking after by the New English Heritage Charity, has only been given an, an eight-year life cycle as such. 
So, if, so we're, our time frames have the, this has been telescoped, which means that we are, we're inevitably seeing change that comes a lot faster and a lot more often. And I think that what that does, it puts into absolute perspective that you're right, that the role of the expert within this and the need for resilience within the role of the expert and to recognise where and when we should play our voice as experts is absolutely key. And I think you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have an answer for you. I, don't, I think I, I recognise that, uh, akin to you, is this, is, this is something that's going to come to the forefront of our minds and still... What does it mean as a profession for the role of expert knowledge as opposed to interested knowledge? And that's obsession with that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from Twitter, right, which yeah. I think is probably a first for the ranks. <laughs> um, it's a nice, easy question um, as well. Yeah, would say um, how do we ensure the resilience of archaeological archives? And that's from Kirsty Lingstad um, at Arkham's. Ah, well, yes. <laughs> not, not being in charge of an organisation that looks after archaeological archives. I, there is, there, there's a, there's a, so there's a giant challenge with, in terms of um, archive material and of the, the, um, the preserved record. We have uh, great challenges there, and I think we're, that's, that's going to be the next big organisational shift is going to be thinking about how um, organisations across the UK work together in, in, on a regional basis to, 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 to manage these things. I think the museum sector is facing up to it, the archaeology sector is facing up to it, the archives sector is facing up to it, and you know, within Suffolk, um, we're currently looking the the, the archives, the archive centre, the, the historical archive centre is has run out of room, and as a statutory basis now needs to do something. But we, we're in a uh, the county council just and it, you know it has to find the money to do something about this. As a profession, of course, we have a huge archival issue, um, and we're producing ever more and more bits of information about uh, more and more detailed things. And I think it's it's. The role of information science and uh, information management is the challenge that we're all facing across across uh, the profession right now, and I think it's I, I absolutely have no answers for that one. <laughs> so it wasn't an easy question at all. <laughs> Do we have any easy or indeed difficult <laughs> questions to finish off on? Yes, go there we go. Do you mind if I just came back? And I, it's really supporting Roger's position. I don't think this is cyclical. It may be cyclical as far as organizations are concerned, but uh, as far as what I would still call the professional involvement of archaeologists in these organizations has gone down and is still going down, I uh, it was in rather nasty development within Edinburgh Castle and the then Chief Inspector of Historic Buildings turned to me Dave, and said something like, David, um, why don't you stop this? Or, I know you couldn't stop it, but the previous Chief Inspector stopped the first proposal for the National War Memorial in Edinburgh Castle. And it's an indication, in a way, of the decline of the role of the professional archaeologists within these organisations. There's no Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments in London. There's no chief inspector of ancient monuments in Edinburgh. I think not having the, ben well, not having the benefit of sitting within one of these organisations, I, it, it, I think it would be unfair of me to comment on specifics of organisations. I suppose I, I have, have the benefit as an academic to make a general, general comment. I, th I, I think you're right. I think individual organisational circumstances have proved and are proving very challenging for the role of the expert that sits within them. The ultimate resilience of the service provided by those kinds of public agencies are going to need to retain the, that expert ability somehow. And I think the, the, 
You are, you're, I think you're, you're right in the role of it, but, uh, but we're not alone, I think, as a sector in that. Um, and I think, that therefore, you know, what, how we understand the role of the expert and the, where the role of the expert plays a function or supply, supplies knowledge within two organisations is one that, I mean, it goes back to really sort of what, I, what I said earlier, that I, it surprises me in a way that management as a subject has not properly delved into heritage and archaeology as a subject because of precisely those kinds of issues. You know, where does, where does knowledge develop within organisations? OK, well, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, you said in the, in the course of your, um, your talk that uh, you pointed out that uh, this society had been around for um, over 200 years, and that in itself demonstrated a, a certain amount of uh, resilience. Uh, we've survived uh, dangerous ancient monuments amongst uh, other challenges. And we've worried about things, we've, we've advocated changes, we've, um, we've uh, been out there encouraging things to move forward. And in the person of, of Henry Rind, of course, we, we look back to somebody who had a lot of the interests that we're trying to grasp at and improve on in, in this uh, conference uh, right now. I trust that we'll always have the, the passion and the curiosity and the professionalism to understand our, our, our place uh, in this world, heritage and the past, and, and do the best we can to, to safeguard um, our interests for ourselves and for the, the general uh, public. Thank you very much indeed for a, for a splendid uh, talk, uh, very erudite and lucid, and obviously very thought-provoking for us. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>